was that you kept detailed torture logs and diaries. Did you? I kept sheets of paper that I had made some notations on. This is between the mattress and springs on my bed. This is one of those packages containing numerous photographs and what became to be known as meticulous methodical diaries. Those pieces of paper in there are these meticulous diaries. These are the pictures of um, the more than 200 photographs, some of them of uh, young men, sexual partners, and these are in some ways, uh, and these that we see here are the, the sheets of paper upon which you made notes. Right. See. This is a copy of one of those pages. It looks like a loose leaf paper. Uh, it does contain information about amounts of uh, drugs and so on. So what is your complaint with the police well, calling these detailed diaries? <laughs> by your evaluation, does this look methodical? Doesn't look methodical. Meticulous? It looks a little sloppy. <laughs> they are not the bound in Corinthian leather written on parchment diaries that the media apparently tries to describe them as. The sheets of paper. What do you feel when you learned There's that uh, not long after your address, uh, arrest, pardon me, the local radio stations, two of them at least, were running a Bob Burdella parody song and were asking people to come to parties wearing dog collars? Well, I think the newspaper article reported that even the families of the victims were upset by the song. I have never had a chance to hear the I song. I had also been told when I first came into jail that the Fox radio station had run a promo giving prizes to their listeners if they showed up at the station in a dog collar and with a leash on. The people here in the institution, the correctional officers, the caseworker, even the psychiatrist, or I think surprised to find out that that upset me. And it did upset you? Very much so. We recall we mentioned before that uh, there were reports in the Westport flea market where you had uh, your shop that um, people would say, oh yes, I do remember uh, he, he had these strange smelling dishes of food, uh, that uh, he had bead bones. And later on there was speculation, at least in the community and in some aspects of the media, uh, that uh, the remains of your victim were somehow being transported and prepared as meals and prepared as jewelry in your shop. I was quickly able to identify to the police the other dealers in the, that section of the market where we re rotated potluck rather than eat the flea market food again. And that you could question any of these people and they'd be able to tell you that the food was good there was nothing suspect about the turkey or ham or beef that was in so these I dishes. I want the police to explain why they allow the loved ones of families to die in the convenient area of Tenth and McGee. I don't think any family of my victims or anybody else that has been killed down related to Tenth and McGee are going to be happy to find out that their loved one is basically written off by the police as far as investigations go, et cetera, because they died in a convenient neighborhood. The police knew what was going on, so it's no big deal. And that accounts for your remark to me, and I don't mean at all to make light of it, that I killed six, but they, the police, by allowing this to stay open, they killed more. Yes. This has been something that's been going on for over 20 years, to my knowledge. It seems to me that you're suggesting that had the police done their job, had they followed the leads, had they really been on your case prior to April 2nd, 1988, they would have caught you and some of the suffering could have maybe, been prevented. Maybe not caught me. Scared me off, maybe. Prevented things from happening after how? Definitely. In a way, do you wish they had? There was a report yes. in the Sunday Kansas City Star in December about the dangers you might face uh, after you leave the Jas Jackson County Correction Facility and are moved to another 
larger prison. Um, how do you feel about reports like that? Do they make you anxious? They do give me some reason for concern, but one of the reasons I'm concerned is that these were not just reports. These were digging out quotes from unnamed prosecutors implicate, implying that the inmates down there are waiting to get their hands on me. I am, at this point, am less concerned about the inmates acting on their own as opposed to the inmates, poor inmate, acting in response to maybe some directive or coercion from some police officers. Do you think you're being set up, perhaps? Well, I think the Star and Times have, since they haven't been able to get a court to put me to death, are now trying to get the inmates to do it for them. Just a bunch of earth is all that's left of 4315 Charlotte. But some people will never forget the house, nor the man who lived here. Bob Verdella, Kansas City's most infamous serial killer, is dead. He died in prison after his victims were killed in his home. Verdella confessed to sexually and physically torturing six men here. But some believe there were more victims and hope digging up the house might unearth some secrets. That's why millionaire Del Dunmire, who owns the property, had workers carefully tear it down. Private detective Ashley Hearn was here in 1988 when the truth came out, and he's been here for the past five weeks, making sure no other bodies turned up. He says the stairs to the basement will be saved, as well as this drain, reportedly used to carry away the blood of Burdella's victims. Well, this appears to be the final chapter of the Burdella story, and no one could be happier than those who live on either side who will split the property.